Our next presenter is David Hancock from Indiana University. Uh, thank you again for switching with Mark. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. I'm just standing here between uh, you all and Addison and a uh, sunny day outside, so I'll, I'll do my best to uh, uh, expedite it. I'm David Hancock from Indiana University. I'm the primary investigator for Jetstream 2, which is what I'll be uh, talking about today, but also the director for advanced cyber infrastructure at IU in charge of our uh, high performance computing, uh, storage systems, cloud systems, et cetera there. So I want to talk a little bit about deploying uh, the Jetstream 2 environment during uh, during the pandemic and just the impacts of, of doing that and the history of, of the program. So uh, I last spoke about uh, Jetstream, I believe here in, in 2017, when the system was relatively new, about a year into production. So we're, we're at a similar point with Jetstream 2. It's a uh, US National Science Foundation production cloud environment. And we still have uh, a focus on ease of use rapidly on on ramping individuals for um, uh, those uh, those demands that may fit either through through gateways or interactive use um, and coupling them with uh, HPC resources. So part of that is is that on demand and interactive computing. We've uh, uh, changed quite a bit in terms of of the type of hardware, which I'll touch on a little bit. And um, we also uh, like to focus and, and bring a little a little art to you all. So the great Maria Morris has designed some, some stickers uh, that I'll, uh, I'll provide, some of which uh, show the back of the cabinets, but also other, um, other fun things for your laptops or other things if you want to collect those. So the National Science Foundation has a, a vision and blueprint, which I won't read this to you. If you're interested, you can go out and, and look. But it's, um, it's all about you know, viewing this as, as a collective ecosystem across multiple centers and institutions. We're not all trying to solve uh, every problem <clears throat> if we're doing it correctly. So was Jetstream any good? Was it useful? Why should there be a Jetstream 2? So, with, um, with Jetstream, it, the project began in 2014, went production in 2016, and we retired in 2022. It was simultaneously a pilot and a production environment, meaning really when we started, we had an idea that, that this would um, be something significant and we could pull off, but it was also uh, a new experience. It was um, acquired as part of a HPC acquisition program, but wasn't exactly a, an HPC system. And, um, you know, we were bringing that into production, not as a, not as a test bed, not as something that uh, would, would go outside the normal processes for the National Science Foundation. And through those, uh, through those years, we had direct service to over 18,000 uh, researchers and educators. Over 8,000 of those individuals were students, uh, and um, you know, all over in different in different fields. Um, most impressively, I think, is it provided seven times the educational service units as any other Exceed resource. This is the um, uh, collection of of systems and and computing centers uh, that the NSF has sponsored that are collaborating and doing joint allocations. So you know, we were able to reach in uh, and help with workshops, classrooms, and uh, onboard uh, different areas and, and make some of that a little easier to reproduce in the Jetstream environment. And then the science gateways that leveraged the system you know, uh, large ones like Galaxy and, and others that are uh, focused on, on uh, education, like Kim Compute, uh, touched over 180,000 people during that time. And a lot of them didn't even know they were using the Jetstream system. So with, um, 
our um, operations and no plan downtime and overall availability of over 98 percent and if you look at this with your cloud hat on of of eventual consistency and um, something something's up which is really how how the world works what you what you see may not be a, a live data anytime um, you're seeing 99.99 uh, percent uh, uptime uh, but there was some reduced capacity you know it's offline or or um, you know one of many services uh, one of the things I'm also really proud of is, is how this kick-started some scientific efforts. Um, uh, this uh, astronomer from the University of Arizona, you probably remember the um, uh, images of the first black hole, the M87 galaxy. This is uh, um, images from uh, Secretaries A, but they used the Jetstream system to prototype a cloud pipeline and um, uh, prove that it would work, would be useful, and um, move that into the, the commercial cloud for an even greater scale. Um, but that team said this wouldn't have been possible without uh, Jetstream 2, or Jetstream. So um, we hope to uh, continue in en enabling that with the, the Jetstream 2 environment. This is uh, just where we are today with the, uh, the newest system. We're about at the end of uh, one year after acceptance and uh, uh, close to um, you know, the middle of our, our first year of, of operations. So we'll be having a review uh, shortly after I, I return. So what's that timeline look like? What the transition look like? We went uh, from the first uh, uh, invitations for projects in February of last year to very quickly um, asking people to to migrate these were distinct awards they weren't exactly a follow-on so not everyone uh, migrated they could choose other systems they could end their projects and, and renew uh, so just in the short time we've had uh, about 900 unique individuals uh, launch instances and um, uh, just about uh, 2,000 people overall on, on those projects. So this does include many of the, the science gateway and training type allocations that were very popular on the Jetstream system. This is also a picture, uh, if, if you're interested in, in coming back with me to, uh, to Bloomington, the Little 500, which is a, a bike race that mirrors the Indianapolis 500, is uh, going on. Um, some of the teams will exchange bikes on the fly as, as the bike is moving. Uh, you're you're uh, jumping on the bike in the race. So we thought this was a good, good analogy to uh, uh, going from, from one environment to the, to the next. Uh, sometimes it works well, sometimes you fall and skin your knees. So um, the things that worked really well in Jetstream 1, uh, allowing direct API access to, to OpenStack APIs and other APIs um, right, out, right out of the gate, really, um, allowing people to have root privileges and that control, um, uh, indefinite workflows, not, you know, not having a 48-hour or even a five-day or seven-day Walcott clock limit, but you perhaps had things running for years, um, as long as your allocation stayed good and you were doing uh, uh, that work. So it's um, uh, something we've carried on into to Jetstream 2, as well as trial allocations, um, allowing people to get on the system with uh, uh, a really low low bar to just uh, launch a couple instances and uh, test out the system. This was not something uh, the other systems in, in the National Science Foundation uh, exceed environment were doing. But trying to force some of these people that were coming from, from labs and, and smaller computing needs into a large research allocation process that was handled on a quarterly basis and you might have to wait six months to get started. That's, it didn't work uh, particularly well, and, and uh, we've learned and, and tried to uh, push um, the uh, greater collaboration in, in that direction to uh, uh, make this easier. Also, uh, not having multi-year allocations, they all terminated at a, at a year before renewal was problematic, so they've changed some of those things in the, uh, the access program which is uh, uh, the NSF's follow-on to, to exceed in, in some ways how, you know, I guess, the, the analog would be, um, you know, what EuroHPC is, is doing uh, post, 
price kind of uh, um, uh, analog. Also having different domains, meaning um, some of the services were, were operating in a different OpenStack domain to keep them, keep them separate, um, uh, provided some, some challenges in, in moving between APIs and, and higher level services, as well as um, not having a, a universal shared file system, uh, which most cloud envi environments do not. We took these challenges and, and lessons and, and put them into uh, Jetstream 2 changes uh, with larger storage capacity going from uh, just over a, a petabyte at each of the main systems to uh, almost uh, 17 petabytes in aggregate. Moving from uh, homogeneous hardware, uh, we were very concerned about the, the software and scale in 2014 to now having uh, more heterogeneous hardware, lots of GPUs, um, the first system providing virtual GPUs to uh, uh, a large scale, uh, which, is, which is great if, if you're trying to uh, uh, teach a class of, of 50 or even 200 people on GPUs, it, it, may, be, it may be hard to get a hold of those um, at, at most uh, institutions. Unifying our, our back-end domains and uh, management, meaning what you see in the web UI is the same thing you'll, uh, you'll see at the command line API, which is the same thing you'll see in, in another Kakao API. These are all uh, just different uh, mechanisms to access the system. And um, uh, also as we deployed systems with our regional partners, leveraging a, a single technology for config management uh, instead of uh, partners saying, well, we want to do it this way, we'll re-implement it, it'll be, it'll be fine over time. Um, it was just easier for us to, to push changes and, and uh, help, uh, help propagate those things. So we expanded from these two partners in, in uh, Jetstream 1 in terms of hosting hardware to uh, multiple smaller regional partners where these are like one rack systems uh, at different regions where they may have um, uh, specialized instruments, data, um, locality, building up expertise, uh, looking to grow these these partners uh, that are that have systems that mirror the um, the larger system at uh, IU in Bloomington. The way people inter interface with this um, comes from these lower level primary. OpenStack services, and uh, they may use one or more of these um, kind of gateway user type services, which uh, which I'll show in just a minute. A better representation of that is is looking at it from a uh, an individual may come in through uh, the OpenStack Horizon project, um, although uh, we don't really recommend that, or the command line interface. They may use Cacao, which is a follow-on to uh, something called uh, Atmosphere that's built out of the, the University of Arizona and the Cyverse project. It's focused on, on templating and uh, uh, using Terraform templates to, uh, um, to propagate and manage um, uh, environments. Or the, um, the Exosphere envir environment, which is now Kind of independently developed, but uh, is an OpenStack third-party client, which is providing just uh, very easy to use and um, low barrier uh, startup for these services to science gateways that um, may be running on the environment and may have dynamically scaling virtual clusters and things like that, which um, uh, users are not necessarily directly aware uh, that they're running on, on Jetstream 2. So we're flipping um, the nature of, of the system. Jetstream 1 was uh, a, a pilot and production environment, and we're, we're kind of taking the same approach, but as a production pilot. Um, that means when we deploy this, we don't want to envision it as a, as a static system and, and seed those pilot routes, but continue to um, evolve and grow the software stack add services over time, uh, which is frankly a lot different than, than most of us have managed our, our HPC systems over time. We bring them in, we test them, we make sure the performance is great, um, and we may do upgrades to 
compilers and software and, and firmware and other things, but we're trying to keep that um, you know, semi-static environment. We're not uh, going through an example of, of a dozen uh, operating system releases or, or things like that where we are doing those things um, without uh, any downtime in most cases on, on uh, Jetstream 2. And we think, um, you know, as, as the, the popular uh, proverb, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, that, that the Jetstream system has really influenced uh, a lot of these things in our community, uh, both um, uh, as, you know, we first, when we first demonstrated at our, our acceptance review in, in 2016, um, things like Apache Mesos and Docker Swarm and Kubernetes and all of these different orchestration systems running. Um, everybody was like, what are these things? And now, you know, this is all, all we're talking about in, in the community. And we didn't build these, these concepts necessarily. Um, we also took things from others. Uh, we saw the scale at, at CERN and, and support from, from NASA and first started building this type of environment in 2009 and um, uh, have really evolved it and continued to, to grow it over time. So back to the kind of title, what were some of the challenges and lessons? I think many of you can reflect on these as you've uh, worked uh, uh, remote in person throughout the pandemic uh, a lot, but um, you know, just being early and adaptive, uh, if you think back to that timeline I showed, as we were writing our project execution plan and, and signing documents for the award, uh, we were all at home, remote, um, had, to, um, had to interface with uh, uh, ever-changing rules and requirements and um, uh, increasing supply chain difficulties. We had to change things like uh, uh, water cooling um, went from uh, GPUs that were, were planned to be uh, direct liquid cooled to air cooled. Uh, we had to change our CPU configs, our um, configurations for, for storage nodes to use different processors to get them delivered on time, our integration process to on site instead of at a facility, um, our, our benchmarking uh, process as well. And um, through all of that, really remembering that at least our definition of, of cyber infrastructure um, includes not only the systems, networking, and services, but the, the people, and in our case, highly distributed teams from New York to New Zealand that were working on these things. Um, and I think most importantly for, for me is to, to be patient, um, have the capacity to uh, uh, accept, tolerate, delay, and uh, in assume uh, good intent from your your partners uh, that um, you know you may not have all the facts or understand uh, the the situation there. Some of the capabilities, which uh, I'll show a few of these, but just run through them really quick, is is taking what was primarily a infrastructure as a service model from Jetstream and evolving those with other services for uh, better orchestration support. Uh, Push button virtual clusters, uh, you know, federated Jupyter hubs, and um, you know easier storage sharing. We've been using um, using Ceph since uh, 2012, 2013, but um, uh, CephFS really wasn't ready for for any of this type of integration, and so uh, we're we're using not only uh, the block and object storage functions of that, but also CephFS to allow people to hook in with OpenStack Manila to, to make it very easy to, uh, to reshare volumes with, um, with others. And um, in, in you know, improving the UI and features that were uh, much requested in Jetstream, uh, such as unified instance management and uh, multi-instance launch. Uh, and we haven't, um, we haven't taken all these uh, technologies and develop them as part of this project. We're taking other things and evolving it or coupling it. The virtual clusters are, are built on um, uh, some of the work we did in Exceed uh, with um, well, folks that are now uh, at um, Georgia Tech and other places. Um, those uh, dynamically scaling slurm clusters got hardened through these science gateways and um, uh, 
communities like Galaxy, where they alone have over 100,000 uh, unique individuals using their system. So uh, it's it really helps uh, improve this uh, this software environment. This is a quick screenshot of, of Exosphere. Uh, this is the primary UI management as as you come in. If you're if you're not uh, not familiar with a, a cloud environment and and launching things and just want to say I want to launch a handful of VMs or launch a workflow or something like that, you're going to go to to Exosphere and do that. You can also connect this to your own OpenStack cloud either through um, uh, Jetstream 2 or di directly through um, through Exosphere. I'll, uh, I'll talk about the features as I, I demo it in just a moment. There's also Kakao, which I mentioned was uh, developed out of the University of Arizona and the Cyverse project. This is really intended to be uh, template driven for complex workflows. So think about your, your Terraform templates that may be um, you know, multi-cloud capable. You want to do the same things um, on multiple OpenStack clouds or in the commercial cloud. You can import those templates. Uh, you can uh, spin them up, make some changes, have things redeploy uh, for you automatically. And um, that's gone from an early alpha release to now attracting some more um, some more individuals on, on Jetstream 2 and will continue to, uh, to improve. <clears throat> some of the highlights uh, thus far in uh, operations, we've already had multiple OpenStack upgrades. I talked about the, uh, uh, the shared, shared storage implementation. We have a continuous integration and deployment pipeline for, for image building. I know others have, have uh, talked about this in, in context of containers. So this is, this is something we've um, integrated with uh, Jetstream 2, where uh, instead of us managing images and, and featured updates, we have pipelines that uh, already do this for uh, two versions of Ubuntu, uh, Rocky, Alma, uh, CentOS, uh, soon to be retired, but these are getting rebuilt, updated on a weekly basis without um, human intervention most of the time. So this is saving uh, 100 or more engineer hours per year that we're doing these things manually. This pipeline's available to customize. We've had other people uh, leverage this and, and uh, could probably be pretty, uh, pretty straightforward to uh, adopt that into a container type format instead of uh, an image based format. So. Uh, check that out. We also launched a, um, you know, the other direction, taking a, a software store uh, approach uh, that's more out of the HPC world. We're all familiar with um, things like modules and, and loading software and, and installing it in a HPC environment. Uh, that was a, a feature where we had, we had a lot of image growth and, and bloat and everything because People wanted to install the same versions of, of software, have us install the same compilers, things like MATLAB, being able to uh, uh, put those on, on kind of a shared uh, software environment, automatically mount those and load those within instances has made some of those things um, uh, a little easier for uh, for the community. We, we first kind of demoed this with uh, CVMFS on uh, on Jetstream one, and then switched it to using uh, CephFS and LMOD on Jetstream two. As I said, this um, this project is not possible without a lot of other funded projects um, and uh, open source software, uh, both the uh, Exceed environment moving to. Uh, um, now access this community that's that's sharing uh, allocations, uh, documentation, ticketing, things like that uh, in a in a you know, relatively straightforward manner in the U.S. Uh, projects like Exosphere, which is uh, uh, now funded by a separate NSF award, they have a pathways to open source ecosystem award and and adopters now all over the the world and trying to build their own their own community for. Um, development or continuing to do that, I should say. Uh, things like Cacao from the Cyverse project, uh, subscription services like Globus and other open source software like um, Custos and, and CI Logon, which um, are using, uh, uh, being used for authentication and, 
and um, uh, making it so we're not having to redevelop a lot of these tools in addition to, to all the other open source software that sits in, in Linux and, and in a cloud environment. So next, um, you know, in, in the interest of, of time, which I'm trying to, uh, to speed along, um, what we have here is, is uh, a beautiful uh, images of a dumpster fire in a lake, which I've used before. Sorry, I didn't generate a new one here. Uh, but uh, I won't preface my demo with any more than that, so in case things go bad. All right, so what we have here is a standard web browser. Uh, you can follow along if you if you want at jetstream2.exosphere.app. Um, this is you know, the basic interface you'll you'll get to if you go there. Um, if I want to add an allocation, I'll be prompted to do so through um, through access by default. Or if you have another OpenStack cloud you want to connect to this, you can do that with the standard credentials that you would do to to connect to uh, a command line environment or um, uh, Horizon or whatever else. So I will uh, do this through Access. Um, by default, it'll prompt you to go through uh, the Access Identity Provider, which if you have an allocation there, uh, you, would, uh, uh, you would have one of those. I'll choose to go through uh, uh, IU because we're federated through, through in common and those of you using EduRoam are, are probably already going to have an uh, identity provider here. I'll correctly type my password, which is or passphrase, which is rather amazing. And uh, it would have prompted me for Duo, but I already did that uh, a few minutes ago. It then asked me which allocations I want to add. Uh, so I'll just choose the, uh, the test allocation here real quick. Uh, which regions uh, I want to look at. So these are the regions of, of Jetstream 2. Um, what I have working is on the primary cloud at IU. And voila, I see a, a very uh, basic interface. I can continue to add projects, continue to connect um, other regions or um, OpenStack clouds. I get into uh, what is showing um, uh, some brief allocation usage, how many service, service units are being run, the instances, volumes that are attached. Um, uh, these are rather high quotas because they're, uh, they're on our test allocation shared by a lot of our, our project team and uh, different, uh, different images that are, that are there, which you can upload your own image, image or, or snapshot and use an image, but generally we want you to use one from the feature pipeline and, and customize it and uh, build some automation on top of that. So I'll take a look at a couple images I have. Um, right now I'm only seeing my images. That doesn't mean that's the only ones running in the project, but uh, by default we don't want to um, sort of cloud it up with everybody else's. I could clear this filter and see what everybody else uh, in the project is doing, but uh, then again, that's not particularly helpful. And uh, you can do some destructive things like selecting them all and then choosing to delete everything in your, you know, your uh, group's, group's lab, which we've fortunately only had somebody do once. Um, we'll first look at this, um, uh, actually first I'll, I'll launch a new instance. Um, so you can see I can uh, upload a SSH public key if I want. It's not a requirement. Um, a lot of uh, people have trouble copying and pasting public keys, and um, uh, so you can you can do this all without um, uploading your own keys if you want. So I'll launch an instance. Um, I'm prompted to basically choose one from the automated pipeline here, uh, whether Ubuntu, Rocky, etc. Anybody have a preference? No. All right. Ubuntu it is. Um, I'm prompted for, uh, to name my instance. Uh, I like the random name feature just because it always comes up with something great. Uh, um, and uh, so indeed it has come up with something great. And then uh, I get to uh, select what sort of flavor I want, uh, the size of the, the instance. Um, 
Oh, and if I want that to be uh, GPU backed or not, you're only going to see the GPU backed instances if you have uh, a GPU instance. So just going to choose a small with a couple CPUs. I can choose how many of these I want to launch. Um, I don't think I need seven. Let's, uh, let's go with three. Three sounds nice. Um, if I want to enable a web desktop or not, if I want to use a public key that I have or not, and if I want to see the secret advanced options. Um, I've enabled experimental features, so I do have some, uh, some advanced options here. Um, I can tell it not to install operating system updates uh, if I think those are going to be problematic. I could have it go on a private network. Um, I could customize the um, uh, cloud config if I wanted to, uh, um, you know, make some make some changes to these deployments. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Just uh, showing some examples. So I'll go ahead and uh, create those and move on to uh, looking at some of the others. So those are building. We have a, a metric to have those deployed within. Uh, within five minutes, if everything is working well, it's generally just uh, a minute or two for those. And while I'm looking at that, look at one of our uh, experimental feature type uh, images. This is um, a workflow image. I don't know if anybody's um, used uh, uh, my binder, but if you look at you look at something called mybinder.org. This uh, allows you to point at a GitHub repository and have a path to uh, a notebook and will automatically um, uh, build a container and then launch that. It launches that on a, a public service which is shared and you don't have dedicated resources. You can essentially do the same thing in Jetstream 2 but launch it on a dedicated instance um, where on the fly it's going to be built from that GitHub repository that you're pointing it at. So if you do that, um, well, this is where the dumpster fire comes in. It looks like this is broken since uh, uh, I played with it yesterday. Uh, ah, I see why. I resized this uh, instance on the fly, and I had not, I had not confirmed that everything was was good. So we'll uh, we'll confirm that and. Go back to uh, uh, the other uh, instance here. So this is the other example that I I was playing with a GPU backed instance. In this case, uh, we're using a, a G3 dot large flavor. Um, so I can see that this is a, a 16 CPUs and one virtual GPU, um, and uh, we've carved it up based on. Um, uh, uh, essentially a 100 based flavors from uh, a partial to a full instance and then using the the back end which uh, uh, leverages the Apache the Apache guacamole project you can get a terminal in a web browser I know you're all amazed you could didn't know how to get a terminal elsewhere but uh, uh, I didn't have to authenticate um, I can uh, uh, do anything I would do in a terminal it's it's Quite impressive. The thing you can't do with your um, uh, terminal normally is uh, actually upload files. So um, you can um, uh, copy and paste um, data in here, which will then be available on the remote cl clipboard. Um, you can also choose to uh, look at uh, and browse the remote. Uh, um, instance uh, tree and see what uh, data are there. Or you can upload files from your browser. This is not particularly performant, but it is particularly convenient if um, you're not someone who's really experienced with SCP, SFTP, etc. So, and then likewise, uh, you can do the same thing with a web desktop. Uh, in this instance, uh, I was playing with um, a, a, a stable diffusion uh, instance which required a GPU and I have brought you the corn of Indiana to the Swiss Alps uh, all through the magic of AI so uh, you know, if you um, uh, if you want to see that you know go searching I don't know that you'll you'll see that anywhere on your your way back to Zurich but uh, I had also talked a little bit about uh, 
the um, the environment and our, our modules. So this is just a sample of some some things available. If I wanted to uh, launch uh, our studio, for instance, which I loaded the module, it's going to come up and launch, and I can do interactive work. The latency is rather high here in the conference center, about 400 milliseconds. So this is a little more painful than uh, back at the hotel, or even uh, uh, certainly from from your normal normal network. But you have a desktop, you have a console log, uh, you also have um, uh, features on uh, both showing the, the internal IP and the, uh, the public IP. If you don't have a passphrase on the instance and you want to use a, uh, or, sorry, a, a public key on the instance and want to use a password, one's automatically generated for you. You can uh, copy that, paste it. Um, if you were quick enough, you could be logging into my instance now and causing chaos. We also have um, some um, uh, graphs that are generated dynamically, automatically on behalf of the user. Um, so they'll be able to see the CPU, RAM, root disk, uh, GPU usage if it's a, a GPU backed instance normally, and um, you know basic things to create snapshots, instance, um, uh, image that instance, uh, restart it, you know, basic things. And then um, when, if you want to resize it, change it to a different flavor, um, if you selected to, to resize that uh, here to a flavor of the same size, it would, um, or the same type, it would actually do that on the fly. You wouldn't really uh, notice anything. It could, could uh, you know, just uh, uh, move that from uh, from a small to a large, uh, for example. We also see that these other instances uh, happen to uh, uh, to work and all boot, all with the same type of functionality, all pretty quickly. Um, I don't have time to show you the um, the virtual cluster um, type of type of creation, but you can. Um, if you selected, I selected an Ubuntu, I didn't have that option. If I selected a, a Rocky-based image, uh, which is, uh, we have this for uh, Red Hat type derivatives, uh, just based on on uh, the virtual cluster pipeline, you have, um, you have access to, uh, uh, to create those sort of on the fly virtual clusters. Launches a Slurm-based um, head node. When you submit a job, it creates another instance or, you know, however many instances uh, are necessary. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing that. It's probably because I selected the wrong Rocky instance. Should have read the latest documentation. And uh, I guess lastly, we'll see if this workflow is working. Uh, which, uh, unfortunately, due to my resize, uh, it's it's not. What this um, uh, binder workflow uh, looks like is is you see the the buttons appearing, and it'll um, it'll turn green when it's all finished. So after this reboot, it'll work. But essentially, if I click this workflow button, what it's going to do in, is take me to a um, Jupyter Notebook in, in the browser running on that instance that's been built from this um, GitHub repository that I pointed to and all done automatically. So these are um, some of the advanced features that are semi-experimental now uh, that, are, that are getting hardened and um, uh, will have better uh, tooling, uh, better alerting, things like that uh, for that system. But if you're, you know, have an open stack environment or have needs just for large training courses, we've had um, classes up to 200, um, maybe even a little above, uh, use the system for workshops, large workshops at, you know, um, the American Meteorological Society where they have a, a Kubernetes-based um, uh, deployment for the classroom so you can just start and dig into your, your training without going through um, all the process of, hey, everybody install this software now, you know, uh, let's troubleshoot the problems that 20% of you are having or you're helping your neighbor and not paying attention. Um, so those, those, um, those things can be much improved by, um, by leveraging the JetStream environment. 
So I am going to uh, wrap this up here, and um, I, I hope uh, I haven't wasted too much of your time, and we haven't gotten to full, a full uh, fire in a lake uh, type scenario. So, as I uh, as I said, we're we're preparing for our, uh, next panel review, trying to integrate some new partners in the process, and doing our first uh, first round of, of surveys. We do annual um, uh, surveys of our community to improve and refine what free features we have, grow that community, and uh, support a few more hybrid gateways and. Uh, continue to share our software and, and practices in the progress in the process so uh, thank you all and um, thanks to uh, the many Jetstream partners that make it possible so I'll take uh, any questions if we have uh, time for just one or two